Okay, hello everyone. Uh, Marie Les from uh, the 3D Light team. Um, I'm the CTO of the team. Uh, it's a small team, we're six people, so it's easy to be CTO. Uh, 20 years in the making. Uh, yeah, it has been 20, uh, 20, uh, 20 years already. Uh, you'll see that later. And uh, today I'll be talking uh, a little bit about 3D Light, but a little bit also of history. Um, since the uh, a uh, little bit of uh, my own observation about uh, the VFX, uh, software engineering side in VFX and in rendering in particular. And we'll talk also a little bit about 3D for Katana. Um, so yeah, um, 3D Light and uh, Katana. Uh, we, like, uh, we like Katana because basically Katana is a perfect vessel for, um, perfect vessel for a renderer. It's basically, a wrapper and uh, around a render engine. And uh, for us, it was an opportunity to put structure around, uh, you know, around our ideas. So it was really a marriage made in heaven, and we thank Foundry for uh, including now 3D Light as a standard uh, render engine inside, um, inside Katana. So as I told you, it's been 20 years since uh, we started 3D Light. And this is uh, my first commit message uh, inside the 3D Light uh, render engine. So as you can see, there's a lot of information in there. Uh, well, it's 99. Uh, it's at 10 PM. It's about the time I go at the, uh, got at the office. And uh, it has been you know, programmed 100 for, uh, meters from here on the La Commune Street. And uh, the commit message various. Uh, I kind of miss the ability to do now commit messages like this today. If I do this today, my colleagues will punch me in the face for sure. And uh, I miss the purity of it. So 20 years on the same software. I don't recommend you to do that here in Montreal. It's a very bad idea. What you should do is like go from company to company every two years to uh, raise your salary. <laughs> yeah. And go spiral it back, loop back, and spiral your salary out of control like this. So that's how you do it in Montreal. But yeah, uh, 20 years, the advantage of doing the same thing for 20 years is really that you become a kung fu master at your craft, right? Uh, and you see a lot of things. Uh, interestingly, a render engine, you are really at the end of the pipeline, OK? And you see, you receive everything, all the garbage that comes to you. It's like, you receive everything, OK? And you see all the crazy things that people do. You are at the receiving end of it. And you discover a lot about people like that. It's like, if you look at your neighbor's garbage, you, you know what they bought, buy and what they eat or whatever. So we know a lot of things about you. OK, so the three areas of, uh, of, rend of 3D light, OK? And we have the luxury of talking about eras since we have been here for 20 years. We started as a, as a, as a render man compliant render engine. Okay? So basically, we mimicked everything render man Pixar did. We just copied everything. And uh, we sold a lot of licenses like that, and we got a lot of clients. Our model was like, we do it exactly as them, but faster or high quality or something like that. And it was the scanline era, rise render engine, no ray tracing, scanline, computers with not so much memory, okay? Totally different world. Then the Frankenstein era is where, oh, you know, there is some ray tracing going on, we have to compete with Arnold, Pixar also is introducing some ray tracing. So this era is the worst one because we had to support, we didn't know what we we're doing. Like, OK, put some ray tracing there, but you still have the rise, rise render engine there, uh, things like that. In the last years, we have been really working hard, and we introduced our own API for scene description. From those 20 years of experience, we bring you this new standard, NSI. We dropped RSL as a shading language. We Larry Gritz's and Sony's OSL is now the norm in 3D light. And of course, the patch tracing. But I want to talk a little bit more about this 20 years, you know, as I see it from my, from my position. VFX plus software engineering, okay? Um, 
So in the 90s, we started, we, we really were defining how, how users interact with 3D, the 3D world. It was a very, very interesting uh, period, okay? Uh, fast-paced innovation, uh, fast-paced and thrilling era. Uh, everything you did was almost immediately an invention. There was a lot of wows, okay? A lot of, uh, a lot of nice things with it. We were spearheading, uh, we were spearheading uh, the, uh, the research in many areas, okay? Even the UI. Uh, for example, if you remember Softimash 3D, the discrete logic programs here, of course, from Montreal. Uh, things like that, even Alias, even though they're, they're from Toronto, still, they did some, some nice stuff. Uh, so guys, the, the, that area is definitely over, okay? We're a bit uh, like the dinosaurs now. We're among the dinosaurs in software engineering, when it comes to sof software engineering and innovation that has a global reach. We don't have that global reach anymore, okay? And you look, you know, if you don't believe me, I mean, think about what 15 years ago, uh, how cars looked, how your phone looked, how your browser looked. It was all different. We progressed so much. So we're, uh, we're really, uh, you know, the, the title of this slide was From Heroes to Zeros, but I changed it because I, I really want to be more politi politically correct here. But I think we lost the thread a little bit in terms of... Um, in terms of innovation, okay? And losing the thread, and what thread did we lose? Well, the thread of usability, okay? How to use the software, the human interface to the software. This is what we lost and that everything else has progressed. You know, your phone has one button now, okay? Look at the software you're using. Uh, it's uh, totally different. Uh, and it's not getting that much better. People are trying. That's why we have Katana 3.0 and all the new innovation Katana 3.0 UI-wise. It's nice to see that people are thinking finally, okay, even a TD tool can be, you know, uh, done for, uh, for artists. Nice, nice to see. But rendering-wise, and, you know, uh, it's from the mouth of the Kung Fu master of rendering, uh, we're still in mental ray legacy, really, if you think about it. It's, the, it's, it's still the world that has been defined by mental ray with all the weird parameters coming back, the threshold, the cutoff stuff, the whatever, I don't know. Every, uh, very problematic for artists to deal with a render engine. Okay. Shouldn't we re-examine re you know, how, how we make and use software right now for VFX? So why so little progress uh, in, uh, in us usability? This is my humble opinion, okay? So the field is ruled by technos. We call them the technocrats, programmers, TDs, a lot of that. But also one of the pro problems is that the end user is actually the labor, okay? So the artist is the labor, but it's the end user. So, and it's the one who gets paid. So imagine if Apple would pay you to have a phone. Your phone will be, imagine how shitty your phone would be. Okay, so now transpose this line of thought to the VFX software. <laughs> That's what you get. Because you're paid to work, you are not buying that software. They buy it from you and you're just a vessel, just a labor, okay? And yeah, of course there are some individual users who buy their software, whatever, but the money is in the big companies, the large companies, okay? That's, and they are leading the non-innovation of our field, okay? That's the problem. It's a dangerous, so field rolled by technos and end user as labor is a dangerous double whammy because the end user's well-being is disregarded, okay? And you know that a programmer is basically the nat natural enemy of usability. <laughs> yeah, the programmer is uh, his mission basically is to produce parameters for the artist to understand, okay? And it comes from a lot of insecurity. Should I do this or that? Well, I'll just put all these parameters and let the artist decide. <laughs> and they call it flexibility and features. 
that's that's the definition of like but the interesting thing is that it's actually it's actually fear you know fear of plunging how much courage does it take to produce a fo phone with one button imagine you know it's crazy how much courage it takes but it's easy to produce a blackberry you know and that's why there is no more blackberry right but our <laughs> well almost none but uh, <laughs> I know there are some people with Blackberries here. But uh, we are in a, VFX is a Blackberry market. We are all Blackberry. That's our software, okay? And um, the other problem is that are we inconsequential? The problem, like, if we make mistakes in VFX software, no one really cares, no one really dies, you know? It's like, okay, we got trouble, but you know, we pour some more money over it, and somehow we go through it. Okay. So I'll come back to this later. I don't think it's true, but we'll come back uh, on this a little bit later. So why I'm saying all this is because to tell you how we think at 3D Light right now. Okay. We have been doing probably the most complicated render engine in the world. <laughs> okay. There are so many parameters. And now we're going totally the opposite way because after 20 years you have seen it all. You know exactly what you, what you need to focus on. And usability is the focal point. Ease of use should be the driving force of all you do. And ease of use includes things like speed and quality. Okay, if it's slow, it's not easy to use. If it's shitty imagery, it's not easy to use. You, have, you need quality. Okay? It's a very, very hard task, okay? And it takes, it takes a total change of mentality, OK? So if you imagine a VFX and software engineering in VFX as a country, usability would be the dictator, OK? Artists and lighters would be the privileged society, OK? And the programmers would be the laborers, the guys who, who make, make this work. The world right now is that basically we have like a non-functioning government at the top, no clear direction. The programmers, TDs, whatever, is the corrupt mafia. And then you have the, <laughs> then you have the artists which are living a miserable life, okay, and trying to survive, okay? So that's the situation. And uh, for your consideration, okay, I would propose that bad usability is not ethical, okay? A software that is difficult to use, you lose time, okay? Time is one of the most precious things you have on this planet. True? So why? You know, why bad usability? Unethical, okay? So 3D light, what now? I've been talking, but you know, nothing about 3D light, so what now? <laughs> <laughs> so we have been working in the background for a long time now to reinvent everything in the rendering field, okay? And I think you will see the repercussion of this very soon. The renderers that you have been using, because you're probably not using 3D Lite, will be trying to copy what you'll be doing, OK? State-of-the-art algorithms all around to remove almost all parameterization from your, from your desk, OK? Only artistic parameters will be, uh, pr will be shown to you. That's how it should be, OK? That means no bullshit parameters like clamping, calling threshold, Russian roulettes, BRDF samples, sampling modes, or sampled versus no sampled area lights. All those things that is part of your craft now will disappear. Okay? And innovative workflows. So, some innovation we have in 3D for Katana uh, one shading parameter to rule them all. No more BRDF environment light samples. And I'll show you this right now. Multi-light output at no cost. Very nice for compositing. Open VDBs as light sources. If you have an incandescent surfaces as light sources, okay? Meaning that if you have an open VDB and if you have a, an incandescent channel inside, you control it exactly as a sampled area light and you can light link it, okay? And you can output it in its own channel, things like that. So let me show you, ah, yeah. The last thing, and actually this is the first thing I'll show you, is perception-based parameterization. And this is something that is very dear to me, okay? So, I, I rendered today, it's a very simple render of a 
volume in which in 3D light I put the scattering as gray and transparency in one, in one side is blue and in other side is red, okay? If you do this in any of your render right now, you won't get this color because you put a scattering and absorption parameters that the color that you put in the UI has absolutely no relationship to what you get in the image. Okay, I think you know what I'm talking about. And, and if the artist goes to the programmer and asks him, why is it like this? And the programmer will say, well, stupid, it's absorption and scattering. It has nothing to do with real life colors. <laughs> so next time he says this, punch him in the face. Because there is actually possibility to provide perceptual base parameters to the artist, okay? And under, under the hood, the job of the programmer is to transform them into something that the render engine can understand. So we did everything is perceptual based in 3D light. Even if it's physically correct, what you put in the, in the little color swatch, you have it in the render. And if we go back to, let me just, yeah, so. If we go back to this image I was showing uh, at the beginning, multi-light output. So I rendered this image uh, this morning in Katana, and uh, at no cost, you have all the light channels separate, okay? All the incandescents, all the lights, everything is output uh, without, you know, uh, without overhead. What this allows you to do it actually allows you to do very nice stuff. For example, you can play, you can play with, the, with your lights. Let me just do this a bit differently. I can, for example, come here and reduce the intensity of this light, okay? This is, this is straight, from the, straight from the frame buffer, okay? And those parameters go back to Katana, as I will show in a video right now, to your gaffer tree, to your light sources, okay? You can take any, you know, anything like this and play with it, you know, more light, less light. You can have the mixer, if you prefer, and go through your channels like this, okay? So to render this image, and uh, there is not much light here, uh, uh, there is not much parameters here to set, I, uh, I, uh, sorry, let me just come back to my main image. So there's a lot of lights here, a lot of materials. I set only one shading sample parameter, okay? You don't have to go to play with all these lights and things like that. One shading parameter. So, and as you can see, there are even little flies that the artist put uh, around, the, around the light sources because he had so much time on his hands that he had, can, could play could put this. So if there's like one takeaway from tonight is that you'll have so much time that you'll be able to put flies around your area lights. <laughs> because there are not many of them in VFX, but a lot of them in, in real life. So, uh, so yeah, that's it. Uh, and one thing, one thing about this image and interesting is that it's a very high dynamic range image. Okay. So, and interestingly, there is tho those areas here they go to up to 100 of intensity, right? Usually you would need clamping to kind of have remove the edges from the aliasing on those, on those uh, you know, here. But it's still perfectly anti-aliased without clamping, okay? So to remove that clamping parameters that you have in other renderers like specular clamping, primary clamping, diffuse clamping, whatever, we had to do some research to do that. And that's what I'm telling you, we're really pushing things to an extreme to remove all the parameters that we think are not necessary, okay? So that's what, uh, where we are going with 3D Light. I hope uh, that you'll try it, and um, uh, it's available now with the 3D Light for, for Katana. Uh, as default, you can install it. It's, I think it's an opt-in or opt-out, I'm not sure. Uh, opt-out. Opt-out, okay, so you're basically forced to install it. And uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much.